And I'm going to pray for him. Let's pray. Can you stretch out your hands to Pastor Jonathan? Oh Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for this wonderful man of God, Lord Jesus. We pray that his words today will penetrate through our hearts, that you will really use him today, Lord, to really touch our hearts, to really help us to learn something. That when we walk out this church today, we don't come out empty, Lord Jesus, but we come out full of your word and your truth, Lord Jesus. Be with him today, Lord. Protect him, cover him, Lord. And just help him today, Lord, to deliver the message that you want him to deliver to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise his name. Amen. Okay, good morning, church. Could you bring my mic down a little bit to echoey? Um, how long have I got, church? One hour. Two hours, one hour. I just, I just, I just want to know so that I have your full concentration. <laughs> I want to know from the beginning. Okay, quick question for you all. What makes our body unhealthy? Bring my mic down some more, please. What makes our body, physical body, unhealthy? Please shout it out. Okay, 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 let's do it one at a time. Let's try that. Overindulgence, I heard. Greed. Wrong food. Sugar and unprocessed. Process food. Fizzy drinks. Stress. Stress. Bad TV. Too much TV. Bad TV. Oh, bad TV. Like just watching bad films, bad movies. Lack of exercise. Laziness, did someone say? Yeah. Okay. I've got here poor diet. Did you have that one? Tick. Lack of sleep. No exercise, stress. We had that, yeah. Smoking. Drug use. Alcohol consumption. Okay, so what are some of the signs of poor health? What are some of the signs? If you were to see it, what would it look like? And don't point at anybody, please. (laughs) And say, that person, no, don't do that. So... I've got that on there, unclear skin. Eyes, puffy eyes, dark eyes, dark under the eyes. Obesity, red eyes. Is that it? Skinny, really, really skinny, yeah. Losing weight. Did anyone say poor digestion? Yeah, constant fatigue, exhaustion, we've got unclear skin. What was the other one? The shakes. The shakes, yeah. Poor posture, indeed, indeed. Unhealthy body. I would like you all, if you will, if you have your Bibles, well, you should have a Bible, church Bible, please turn to John chapter 17. Can we... I have the next slide up there, which should show the, so I'm looking at here and it's, and it's blank <laughs> and it's up there. Thank you so much. John chapter 17, we're looking at verses 20 to 26, that's from the Church Bible, page 1085. If you have it, please shout Amen. I'm going to ask somebody to come forwards and read verses 20 to 26 from John chapter 17. Jesus prays for all believers. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. 
the glory you have given me since, have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in each may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Let's just pray, Heavenly Father. Once again, we are here to worship and to praise your name. And Lord, we just thank you for who you are and what you've done in our lives, Lord, and we could just testify of your goodness forever. And Lord, you and your presence is here among us. And we thank you for your word. It's your revealed will written down for us to read and study and digest and meditate upon. And so, Lord, may we do just that, delighting in it. We should enjoy reading your word. Forgive us for times, as Srin has said, where we have not read it. We've been too busy. No, we shouldn't be too busy to read your word. Forgive us for idolatry and putting things above you. Forgive us. Lord, may we love your word, meditating upon it day and night. Speak to us now. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. Amen. So before Jesus is arrested, before he is later crucified, he prays this prayer, what we've just read, verses 20 to 26, for all believers, for all those who will believe. That's what that prayer is for. So I would like to encourage you all in your spare time to read that prayer again. He firstly prays for the disciples, then he prays for those who will believe. That's me and you, amen? amen. We're believers this morning, right? So please, in your spare time, read that prayer and digest it. It's very deep. Very deep. I'm going to read verses 22 and 23 from the New Living Translation. So 22 and 23 from the New Living Translation. I, that's Jesus talking, have given them, that's his followers, the glory you, he's talking to the Father, gave me. Are you with me so far, church? I have given them the glory you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. Talking about God and the Son. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience, he's talking about believers now, may they experience such perfect unity, listen to this church, that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Are you catching that church? I'm going to read that again. It's deep. Jesus is saying to the Father, may they, that's the believers, experience such perfect unity. Everyone say perfect unity. That the world watching will know that you sent me. Do you know last week we spoke about the gospel being proclaimed. We are to proclaim the good news, talk about it, share it. We're supposed to also act it out, aren't we? One of the ways we act out the gospel, one of our witnesses to the world, is our perfect unity. Church, you're going to sleep too quick. Let's get a lively. Our perfect unity is what will witness to the world. They will then know that God sent his son and that God loves them, the world, as much as God loves the son. Jesus' prayer is that we as believers are one. Everyone say one. In the same way that God, the Father, and Son are one. And also that we should experience perfect unity so that the world will know that God sent Jesus into the world for them. Now we must ask ourselves that question. Do we show perfect unity? 
that the world knows that God loves them? Ask yourself that question. Do we show as a church, as a body, perfect unity that when the world looks at it, they are like, God must love us. Because look at how God is with them. By our perfect unity, the world will come to understand they are loved by God. I'm going to say that again. By our perfect unity, the world will come to know that they are loved by God. Through our perfect unity. The church is one body. Each member of the body has different roles, different functions, but yet each member is vital to the body. Church, are you hearing me? Because it's, it's getting in me. Each member has a different role, different function, but yet the church is to be unified. So what makes the body unhealthy? The body being the church now. What fractures, what damages the body being the church? What causes disunity in the church, the body? So I want to be a bit practical today. Everyone say practical. Okay, let's go to the next slide. There we go, look. We have a church there looking very sorry, looking very poorly. I would like to give you nine things that make the body unhealthy talking about the church. Nine things, I'm going to try and go through them quite quickly. I could have done many more points on this, but I'm just gave you, giving you nine. Say, thank God. <laughs> thank God, amen. How long have I got? <laughs> nine things that make the body, that's the church, unhealthy. Everyone say unhealthy. Number one, self-centeredness. Everyone say self-centeredness. There are people that are constantly moving from church to church. The key word I'm using there is constantly. It's not wrong to look for a church. That's my disclaimer. It's not wrong to look for a good church. You have to look for a good church, right? But there are some people that are constantly moving from church to church. We call it what? Church hopping. It appears that they're looking for that perfect church. But as you all know, there is no perfect church the minute I came here this morning the church became less perfect the minute you all showed up here the church became less perfect wherever you go you make the church less perfect so there is no perfect church but yet there are people running around looking for that perfect church what they're looking for is something that appeals to them People that look like me and speak like me and act like me. That's the people I'm going to get on well with. The songs must sound a certain way. The preacher must speak a certain way. And then when things feel a bit boring, it's time to look elsewhere and move on. We need something more exciting. This is why certain churches are more popular than others. And I hope you all know that big church doesn't mean, pop, uh, does, doesn't mean healthy. Did you know that? I hope you all know that. That big church, lots of people church, doesn't mean it's healthy. Right. And this is why certain churches are more popular than others. They have the stage, you see. And they've got the spectacular lights, the smoke screen, the glitter ball. Have you seen those sort of... Okay. <laughs> I won't name amazing musicians and that's all good to have good musicians and artists dramatic and theatrical pastors who do some most crazy demonstrations you saw the one with the spit in the hand do you know the one I'm talking about there's a pastor that put spit in his hand and wiped it on the guy's face I won't say his name that was his analogy to show what Jesus did it went viral. Consumerism, everyone say consumerism. That's the idea that by spending and buying more and more and more, you will become happier. 
That's what consumerism is. By you buying, buying more goods, you will be happier. How many of us like to buy goods? Amazon Prime. Do you know, I bought, an, I bought an item the other day from Amazon Prime. I have Amazon Prime membership because I want it to come quicker. <laughs> See, I'm being hypocritical now, aren't I? And do you know, it came in three hours. That was the quickest I've ever had. I know it can come the next day or sometimes it can come in the, e in the night before 10 p.m. But this one came in three hours. I was like, what? I was shocked. Consumerism is the idea that by spending and buying more and more and more, you'll be happier. Consumerism then becomes addictive. Why? Because real joy and contentment is never achieved. Right? So you've got to keep buying more and more and more, but it's never achieved. It becomes addictive. Well, I want to say that consumerism is also in the church. Did you know that? There are so many fellowships to choose from. And it often feels that they are competing with one another. Doesn't it feel like that sometimes? We've got churches down the road, we're not working well together. You've got one church down the road that might have a lot of money. Then you have another church just a few meters down, struggling and suffering. It feels sometimes that we're just competing and we're supposed to be one body. Which one do you choose? Do you choose the modern church? The stylish one? The classy one? The traditional one, the cozy one. Wasn't that cozy this morning, was it, when you came into the church? <laughs> Freezing. You choose the cold church. <laughs> Nostalgic. Do you choose a church where you, all that nostalgia is there? What about an edgy church? Do you choose an edgy one? Where the pastor's wearing leather clothing and looking like a biker? Do you choose a black church? Majority black. Do you choose majority white church? Small church, mega church. What do you choose? Looking for what I want is called self-centeredness. Looking for what I want is self-centeredness. People like that soon become agitated. Right? They become unsettled. They become moany. Have you met some moany people? Irritable. And then this negatively impacts everyone else in the church. Self-centeredness makes the body unhealthy. Look for a church where God's word is preached, where God is worshipped and adored. A church that has good doctrine, good theology, that believes in the Trinity. Yeah? Number two, everyone say number two. Being impatient and unkind to others. That is what makes an unhealthy church. Please turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 1 to 6. Shout amen if you have it. Apostle Paul talking. As a prisoner for the Lord... Then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. So words are so important, completely, it says there, not partly. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort, church. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Amen. We are all one mixed bag, aren't we? We are a mixed bag of people. 
We look different, don't we? Yeah? You, all, you look different. Roger, you look very different to me. Yeah, you do. We look different. And also, we process things differently as well. Did you know that? That's really key. We process things differently. We have all been shaped by different experiences and circumstances. Did you know that? We're not the same. And this means our passions and our desires are different. Did you know that? Our passions and our desires are different. Different emphasis. Also means when it comes to sin, we also have different passions and desires also. Different proclivities. Because the other person is not like us, we can become impatient with them or unkind with them. Why? Because they're not like us. We have such a problem. We're, we're so happy that we're different, but yet we have a problem with somebody being different. I was thinking about it the other day. If I was driving um, and I'm in a rush and there's a car in front of me, they're taking their time. I need to exercise patience because they are different. They may not be as good as a driver as me. <laughs> It had to be that one, didn't it? <laughs> but they may not be in the same circumstance that I'm driving in. Yeah, they may not be in a rush to go anywhere. They're different. Different circumstances, different things going on. But I want them to be like me. I want them to drive quickly like the way I'm driving. I want them to be like me. Do you see the problem? You want them to be like yourself. That's why we have a problem with each other oftentimes, because we want them to be like us. Have you ever thought about this, of someone in church? Why do, you, why do they talk so quietly? Why do they talk so loudly? Why do they move so slow? Why haven't they learned this by now? Why are they still making the same mistakes? Why can't they do it? Do we think those sort of thoughts? One of the fruit of the Spirit is patience. And we need patience with one another. Because they're not like you. Another fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. So we need to be gentle. We need to be kind with one another. Because they are not like you. There is something that we all have in common though. That's interesting, isn't it? None of us are perfect. None of us are perfect. That's one thing we all have in common. There's another thing we have in common. We all need Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I want you to look at your neighbour, if you do have a neighbour, and tell them, you need Jesus Christ. Christ. How did that land? (laughs) How was that? (laughs) We all need Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Growing in Christ is what we call sanctification. Everyone say sanctification. That's the process of growing more and more like Christ, more Christ-like, more godly, more holy. It's called sanctification. And that is a process. Everyone say process. So when you fail to realize that that is a process, you're going to treat people in the wrong way. You're going to be impatient. You're going to be grumpy with one another. Being impatient and unkind to others makes the body unhealthy. Number three. Everyone say number three. Gossip and slander. Please turn in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20. We're looking at points that make the church unhealthy, factors that make the body unhealthy. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20. I need to be a bit quicker now. Page 1167. The Apostle Paul again writing to the church in Corinth. Are you there yet, church? Amen. Amen. For I, that's the Apostle Paul, am afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be. And you may not find me as you want me to be. (laughs) I fear that there may be discord Jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, 
and disorder. The Apostle Paul is concerned that when he visits the Christians in Corinth, they will still be doing the same things they were doing. Did you hear that? Still. They will still be doing the same things they were doing. There's been no growth, maturity, Christian maturity. Still doing the same nonsense they were doing. And Paul is concerned that when he comes there, he's not going to be how he wants to be. Because they are not how they are supposed to be. Still living like the ungodly. Notice that gossip and slander are in that list. Gossip and slander. Now church, you need to be on your guard. You need to be cautious when somebody comes to you and says, have you heard? <laughs> when they start that way, you need to do a couple of things. Maybe just run or you shut them down. Everyone say, shut them down. And I don't mean rudely. Sometimes you might have to be a bit more abrupt. Whenever somebody comes to you with, have you heard? Mm-mm. Run. What follows next could be a big problem. Gossip and slander play a huge part in damaging the body. People are spoken about and they are not present. They're not present when they're being spoken about. That's the issue. It is all done behind their back. And by the time the person comes to learn that they've been gossiped about, the damage has been done. The hurt has been caused. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 23 says, Those who guard their mouths and their tongues keep themselves from calamity. Right? Keep yourself from calamity. That's Proverbs 21, 23. Those who guard their mouths and their tongues keep themselves from calamity. Now, then you have slander. Slander is slightly different because slander is where the statements are untrue, damaging. See, gossip, the information could actually be true. The, 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 the information could actually be nice. Did you know so-and-so got a new car the other day? True statement, and it's nothing horrible, but it's still gossip. Slander now is damaging in a different way because it's negative and it's untrue. Statements made about somebody that, are, that defame their character. Listen to what Proverbs 21, 19, sorry, Proverbs 20, verse 19 says. Who likes Proverbs here? I love Proverbs. I had to read it a lot growing up. <laughs> Proverbs 20, 19 says, a gossip betrays a confidence. That's exactly what they're doing. They're betraying a confidence. Then it says, so avoid anyone who talks too much. The Bible's telling you to avoid anybody who talks too much. So it's not me saying it. The Bible says, avoid anybody that talks too much. Do you know, I don't like people that talk too much. <laughs> so I know you're going to have to be careful now when you're talking to me. But when people talk too much, I kind of start thinking things in my head. Hmm. Because if they're telling me about somebody, then they could easily be telling someone else about me. Easily. The same way you can gossip to me about someone, it's the same way you can gossip to someone else about me. Guard your mouth. Guard your tongues. And I do not like atmospheres of gossip. I hate it. And I stay away from it. Stop the gossiping. Stop talking about people who are not present. Our words do two things, don't they? They lift people up, or they do what? Pull them down. That's what our words do. They uplift, or they tear down. They encourage, or they discourage. So gossiping and slandering makes the body unhealthy. Okay, we're on number four, and I'm looking at the time. Number four, everyone say number four. Absence of church discipline. Any absence of church discipline makes the body unhealthy. Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Looking at verse 19, the Apostle Paul again speaking. 
Shall I tell you men if you have it? Paul says, in the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So what I want to say is disagreements and problems will occur. They are inevitable. Amen? Yeah, different people, different circumstances, different things that have shaped us. There will be disagreements. We're not going to agree on the same things all the time. We should definitely agree on sound doctrine. Right? We should definitely agree on the most important things of our Christian faith. But other smaller things we can disagree on. But the Apostle Paul goes further. He says that God can use a division and a problem in the church to reveal who is approved by God. Did you catch that, church? Let me explain. You may have a problem in the church, a division. But God can use that to show who's approved and who's not. In a church that I went to before, many years before I went to that church, there was a division in that church. The division happened actually in a home group. The home group became a different faction of the church. The home group became toxic. And it had to be cut out and removed from the church. And I felt that it was a way for the whole church to see what was approved by God or not. So it became clear that this thing that was going on was not good, was not healthy, and had to be removed. That's what I believe it's sort of saying here. It, it separates the wheat from the chaff. The sheep from the goats. It makes things clearer to see what's going on. Remember, we're all dissimilar and have different experiences. We're all at different stages in our Christian walk and our maturity, aren't we? But when there is sin in the camp, when there is sin, the church must discipline. Do you understand that, church? When there is sin in the camp, there has to be church discipline involved. It is required. Too often, the church doesn't want to do it because they're concerned about losing somebody. We shouldn't be concerned about losing somebody due to church discipline. If that person needs to go, they need to go. And so often, churches don't do it because they are scared about losing people. And numbers, it's a numbers game. Right? Stubborn sin cannot be swept under the carpet. Stubborn sin has to be dealt with. And do you all know that the church has the authority to deal with these things? Do you all know that? Matthew chapter 18, verse 18. Please turn in your Bibles quickly to Matthew chapter, 5, to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. I'm not going to read it, but I just want you to look at it. Matthew chapter 18, looking at verses 15 to 20, page 985, I believe. So here we have church discipline. I've spoken on this before. Verse 15, I want to call it step one. Please look at verse 15 of Matthew chapter 18. The person who has been offended is to go to the offender and point out their wrongdoing. After there's a confession or an apology or an acknowledgement of that wrongdoing, the issue should be resolved. Did you catch that, church? Reconciliation should be achieved. This is a private matter. I'm going to repeat it again. When a person has been offended, you go to the person that's offended you. You go to them. That's two of you. And you resolve the issue. The person who has... The accused person should apologise. They should actually recognise what they've done was wrong. They apologise. They confess. And the problem is then resolved. Just two people. No one else had to know. Now this is where the problem is. The step one is not often carried out. Right? So what happens? People start to do what? Gossip and slander. And then you have a bigger, bigger mess. If you've been offended by somebody, pray about it. 
certainly go to the Lord in prayer, ask for wisdom, ask for direction. Go and approach that person. You're not going to come to start a fight because you are a Christian. They are a Christian. So we're talking here about believers. So they should already start to recognize, hold on, this person's come to me. They needed courage to come and speak to me. I've done something wrong. Maybe I didn't realize how wrong it was. That's fine. I apologize. It's done. It's a private matter between two people. Then we have in verse 16, step two. This is if step one does not work. Step one should have worked, by the way. Because some of us need to be more Christian, right? So we have step two. This is when the offender does not acknowledge their sin. The accused. So then the person who has been offended should then approach that person with one or two others. So at the most, you have four people. Three people at the most, four of you. You did step one, it didn't work. Remember, this, you are a Christian speaking to another Christian. So it should have worked, but it didn't. You go with one or two other witnesses. So at most, there's four of you. This doesn't go to the whole church. It's just four of you. The witnesses play a huge role because they can see what's going on. The offended person might actually be wrong themselves. Did you know that? So the witness, witnesses can see, hold on, the offended person is exaggerating or is taking it too far. So they're not just there to back up the offended person because the offended person could be wrong themselves. But they are witnesses. They can see what's going on. Hopefully, with the approach of the offended person and one or two other witnesses, hopefully the situation should be resolved. Because the person who is accused should now see this is serious. They've now come with one or two other people. And I should have actually said sorry from step one. So at the very most, we have three or four people. Verse 17, step three. If this is not successful, Step one is not successful, step two is not successful, then the offender, sorry, the offended person needs to then go to the church. And when we say church, we're probably talking more about the leadership. You see how this person who has done wrong is still being protected. You're not slandering them, you're not gossiping about them, you're trying to reconcile with them, and you're also still protecting them at the same time because you went to them personally, privately. And then you went back with, to them with two or three, one or two witnesses. And then now you've gone to the leadership who are Christians and should know how to handle things too. And the person who's done wrong should now see that because this has gone to leadership, they now need to apologize, surely. This is the third time. And then we have a step four. Wow, should it really get there? If unresolved after the matter goes to the church, the leadership, the Bible says, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. When you read that, you think that's a bit harsh. We know how tax collectors were treated, low of the lowest, no one liked them. That sounds harsh. But then when you think about it, really is it? You are a Christian, the offended person is a Christian. The person that's offended you is a Christian. You're all Christians here. Should it have gone to that level in the first place? We're all believers, followers of Christ. It is the believer that should know about love. It's the believer that should know about forgiveness. It's the believer that should know about peace and patience and kindness. We are supposed to believe that and live it out. So how on earth should it get to this point where we are now telling them to leave the church or come out of membership? It is the believer that should have God's spirit working in them. It also made me think about communion too 
and I had a conversation with somebody about that recently. Should we be taking communion if we have a grievance towards somebody? No. 1 Corinthians talks about that, right? If you have a grievance with your brother or sister, you shouldn't partake. We're supposed to take of the emblems in a worthy manner, not unworthily. So if you have a grievance with somebody, you're holding on to resentment or you're holding on to bitterness and you've got a problem with somebody, do not take communion. Communion is very serious. So you shouldn't take it. Remember here we're talking about Christians. We're not talking about the ungodly. We're talking about Christian people that are saved. You should be quick to reconcile, quick to forgive. So church discipline typically starts privately and informally, growing to include the whole church, only when necessary. In its final formal and public stage, church discipline involves removing someone from the church or from membership and participation in the Lord's table. The goal of discipline is always redemption. That is the goal of it. It's not to make somebody feel horrible and, and nasty. It's to redeem, it's redemption. It's to reconcile. Protecting the other sheep in the body of Christ and honouring the name of Christ. That is the whole purpose of it. So absence of church discipline makes the body unhealthy. Let me move to number five. I'm going to go a little bit quicker now. Ineffective preaching and teaching makes the body unhealthy. Everyone say amen. amen. Preaching that is sloppy and careless is unhealthy. Teaching that is unprepared is unhealthy. Remember, preaching and teaching are slightly different. Preaching is the proclamation of the gospel. You don't have to have notes to preach because you're just proclaiming the gospel and telling of the good news of Jesus Christ. Teaching needs more preparation. So sloppy preaching, careless preaching is unhealthy. Unprepared teaching is unhealthy. Preaching and teaching that is not balanced is unhealthy. Too much preaching on hell and none on heaven. Too much preaching on heaven and none on hell. Because some Christians don't even believe in hell. Or supposed Christians. Too much preaching on sin, none on grace. Too much preaching on grace, none on sin. Too much preaching on money, no preaching on money at all. Because you've got to talk about money, right? Too much preaching on forgiveness and none on judgment. Too much preaching on judgment, none on repentance and forgiveness. Preaching needs to be balanced. Teaching needs to be balanced. Preaching that is targeted at individuals and the pulpit used to bash people and tell them off is unhealthy. So you have to be very careful when you're up here speaking that you're not bashing people and you're not using situations in the church to come and use the pulpit now to start whipping them. Teaching with no conviction is unhealthy. If I do not believe what I'm preaching, there's no point in me preaching it. I must believe it first myself before I preach it to you all. Teaching with no application is unhealthy. There's no point of hearing stuff and you don't know what to do, how to do it, right? You need application. And without that, it's unhealthy. Ineffective preaching and teaching makes the body unhealthy. Amen? We're nearly there. Number six, lack of God's word. A lack of God's word. I'm not going to spend long on these ones. A lack of reading God's word in the church is unhealthy. Sometimes churches don't read God's word out. It's not read out. The passages are not read out. You must read God's word out. A lack of preaching the gospel is unhealthy. A lack of biblical teaching is unhealthy. Preaching must be based on God's word. The teaching must be based on God's word. Amen? God's word not being the authority in the church and in people's lives makes the body unhealthy. So some of us don't quite believe this. Do you know that? Some of us don't quite believe this. I remember when we preached through the book of Genesis and it's good when you go through a book because you've got to do each chapter and you've got to go through it carefully. I got to the part of Sodom and Gomorrah and I knew what was going to happen. Sodom and Gomorrah, I have to speak on homosexuality. 
Somebody didn't like it. They came to me afterwards, not the same day, and they said, I had a problem, Jonathan, with what you said. What you said wasn't nice. And I just said, did what I preach, was it from God's word? Because if I didn't preach God's words, that's the problem. But if it was from here, they kept quiet. I asked the question, did I preach from here? They kept quiet. That's all that matters, right? It must be from God's word, whether it's uncomfortable or not. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, what all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that we, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen? So a lack of God's word makes the body unhealthy. Number seven. Everyone say number seven. seven. Nearly there. Insufficient praying. The Bible reminds us to pray without. Amen. The Bible reminds us not to worry about anything, but pray about everything. Amen. Prayers unprayed will be prayers unanswered. We need to pray. Prayers unprayed will be prayers unanswered. And when we pray, we pray in God's will. A lack of prayer reveals a lack of faith and trust in God's word. Did you know that? Let me say that again. Let it sink. A lack of prayer reveals a lack of faith and trust in God's word. Because if you trust in God, you will pray more. If you really trust God and you know he's going to deliver, you're going to pray more. So when we're lacking, it's because we're, mm, is he God really going to do this or not? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. Coming to the end here. Number eight. Emphasis on nostalgia. Emphasis on nostalgia. Nostalgia is a sentimental. Cem- oh, I can't even say the word now. Nostalgia is a sentimental longing for the past. So next week we celebrate 130 years of our anniversary. Reflecting on things is good. Reminiscing over the good times is nice but we need to be very careful that the emphasis is not on nostalgia. Amen? I like the church how it was. I like the church when it had pews. I like the church when it had an organ. I like the church when it had this big choir. I like the church when we had over 100 members. This emphasis on the past can be very dangerous and unhealthy for the church. Reveling in the past can cause us to sin. Did you know that? Nostalgia can cause us to moan and complain because we want it to be how it used to be. Right? So the, every time you want it to be how it used to be, you're moaning and you're complaining, sin creeps in. Remember how the children of Israel were when they were delivered from Egypt. Yeah, when they went through the wilderness and God gave them manna. They moaned and complained. They said they wanted the better food when they were in Egypt. Never satisfied. The past is viewed as the glory days and nostalgia can become a stronghold. God's purpose is that we grow, amen? And that means change oftentimes. God reminds Israel through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 43, that he is doing a new thing. We need to be prepared for new things, amen? Last point. Unclear vision. Proverbs chapter 29 verse 18 says, from the King James Version, where there is no vision, the people perish. This verse is often misunderstood. It's not about some random prophecy and it's not about dying either. What it actually means is without the revelation of God's word, it's always about God's word, people will run wild. The absence of divine revelation, God's word, people will lead a more immoral life. There will be a spiritual decline. So a church needs to have vision. We get that by seeking God's will which we can find in his word so I come to a close here nine points please go to the next slide there they are nine points 
of an unhealthy church. Nine points that I put together here. I came up with some other ones, a disregard to leadership, a disregard to those who are hurting in the church, heavy shepherding, as when the pastor's too much in your life, telling you who you can marry and who you can't. No pastoral care is unhealthy. No follow-ups with people. I haven't seen you for three weeks. What's going on? What's happening? No follow-ups. No transparency on finances, so you don't get to know how the money's been spent, what's going on, what's happening with the money that you're putting in to the bags. No accountability. So often leadership, having no one else to speak to, just being their own boss. And my last one here is no care for the aesthetics of the church. I think they matter. The carpet, the chairs, the refreshments may not be the most important thing, but I think they matter and they show how we treat the church, our attitude. How do you treat your home? How do you look after your home? It says something about yourself. I end here. Let's remember the words of Jesus' prayer. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. May we have perfect unity in this church, even though we may have disagreements. Perfect unity in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.